welcome to 2020 Virtual STEAM Night. I am Mrs. Cameron. I am the STEAM teacher at uh, Gordon W. Mitchell School, and um, I work with grades three through six. Uh, but this year, we are bringing STEAM Night to all of our EBPS families. So welcome to our preschoolers all the way through um, to our seniors in high school. Uh, this year, we have presenters from all over, all over Massachusetts and all over the country. Um, so we're really excited for you to learn from them. And every presenter also has an activity that you can do to follow along with um, what they're doing on camera. So if you need any more information or if you have any questions, use the QR code that comes with your STEAM materials bag and it'll bring you right to, um, to my website. If you don't have the QR code, then you can go to the ebps.net website and it'll bring you to my homepage. Um, and while we are giving away giveaways and everything like that, you can also find that on my website. Um, while we are doing STEAM night, whether you are watching it live or on demand, make sure that if you're making anything and you want to share, to use the hashtag great to be a Viking on social media so people can see, or you can head to the Flipgrid link and you can upload some videos there. I hope you have a wonderful STEAM night. I'm so excited for everyone to see all the awesome presenters and learn from all these amazing local people and people from across the country. So have a great time and and I will see you at the end of STEAM night. Hi, science enthusiasts. My name is Ms. Jenna Mercury, and I am a national sales consultant slash curriculum content expert and science and math enthusiast. I'm located in Charlottesville, Virginia, and my job is actually quite unusual in a way. I'm going to try to explain it to you. What I do is I support the sales team at our company, which is called Explore Learning. And we have simulations, math and science simulations, or we call them gizmos, for grades kindergarten through 12th grade that are digitally delivered. So it's easy to do science and math when you're using your tools to sort of understand how things work a little bit better. And my job and my role is to work with our sales team to connect them with our teachers and students to show them how cool Explore Learning is. So I basically get to kind of play with games all day. I guess if you think about it that way, I get to play with math and science games all day. And they're really fun math and science games. So uh, I go all around the country and I would go into classrooms when it was safe. And I would share Explore Learning gizmos with students and we would do fun activities together. And I also present at conferences, which is how I met Ms. Cameron. Um, and so I've gone everywhere from this to Seattle, Washington, to California, and up in the Northeast in Boston, and south down of Florida, and Texas, and Ohio. I go all over the country. It's such a fascinating and fun job. So I'm going to share with you a really quick uh, art activity. I thought I would bring it down to the little guy of the Explore Learning family, which is called Science for Us. It's for uh, kindergarten, first and second grade, but grades three and four and five can make it your own. And we're going to create today some nature's bookmarks. Supplies are simple. You simply just need uh, some packing tape, scissors. You can grab some index cards if you wanted to put your nature on a card, and, but you can also put your nature just in your plastic uh, packing tape as well. And if you don't have packing tape, you can definitely still use some clear scotch tape, which is fun too, um, uh, and make your nature's bookmark. So the main thing is to go outside and grab some nature. Make sure you try to grab things that are really just on the ground. We don't want to pick things off of trees because they're still alive. Uh, but you might find, like I found some clover on the ground that was actually more of a weed next to the grass. So I grabbed it and I was able to get some awesome roots and these flower petals were on the ground. They're beautiful and pink in color. And you might even find some fall things. I have some blades of grass and things like that. So you're gonna just take your nature and you're gonna place it on your index card and like this in whatever arrangement you want. And then you'll just take your packing tape and you'll tape it over to seal it in place. And then you can just take a, a hole puncher or simply just poke a hole using a pencil. And then you can take some string or some twine like this and just loop it through. And so you can create 
your very own nature bookmark. And I love this, just a fun little artsy activity to do that combines a lot of art and nature. And, um, and also you'll be able to sort of keep your nature throughout the winter when the winter months start, you don't see any more leaves on the trees and whatnot. So it's so super, super awesome. If you can't find the leaves in your trees, you can always ask your parents to use any of the indoor plants that you have. Make sure you ask first, but it's super fun. I am so excited to join you for your steam night. I hope you guys have a blast with all of your activities. And thank you so much for hanging out. Again, I'm Miss Mercury, and um, and that's what I do. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the library. I'm Ann Vantran. I am the children's librarian, and I'm excited to be with you for STEAM Night 2020. Um, what we do here at the library that is related to STEAM, we do a lot with math. Um, I have a budget, and I need to stick to it by the end of the year, so there's math involved. Um, Chris, my associate, does a lot of artwork around the children's room, as many of you have seen. So we certainly incorporate some art into our um, daily lives here at the library. We also do um, some science and engineering um, based on what kids are doing. So sometimes we have activities out for um, kids to explore, and a lot of times they deal with science um, and engineering. Um, we also deal with technology here at the library. We certainly use a program to check your books in, check them out, look up materials, place them on hold and things like that. Um, Chris and I also are part of the team that runs our Facebook page and our Instagram page. Uh, we also run Twitter and um, we also run our own website, so some of us have a hand in doing that as well. So a little piece of technology there as well. So one of the things when we are looking for activities for kids to do at home or here at the library are things that are readily available um, and are inexpensive. So that's what I was thinking about when I chose what to do for this activity. And I'm not sure if you have one of these laying around, um, but we do here at the library because I use this for story time, um, a beach ball. So I thought I'd do a couple activities um, that involved a beach ball for you. So if you have one hanging around the house, take it out, pump it up, and try one of these three activities. So the first one is to um, use 10 index cards and eight paper cups and build a structure, the highest structure that you can, Build a structure that will support your beach ball without it rolling off and of course hands off. So you're going to place your beach ball on whatever structure you have, take your hands off and see if it will stay by itself. It is a little challenging because the beach ball is round and it's going to want to move on its own so you have to incorporate that into your planning um, for your structure. So, um, second activity is using two feet of aluminum foil. You probably have some at home. Mom, I'm sure, has some. This is what we cover food with, right? So take two feet of aluminum foil, and you can just estimate the two feet, um, and build a structure to hold your ball. And what we're looking for here is almost like the torch that they carry at the Olympics. So the aluminum foil is going to be the bottom part of the torch that people hold, and the beach ball is going to be the flame part. So when you finish, when you think you have something that will hold your beach ball, um, you are going to hold the torch part with one hand, put the beach ball on it, and your other hand is off. So see if you can walk across a room holding your beach ball on the torch. That's number two. Number three is a little bit more, well, they're all fun, but this is a little bit more fun. So find a friend, find a family member, and take the beach ball and put it between your bodies. You can do it on the front, you can do it on the side, you can do it on the back, whatever makes you happy. And you have to keep up constant pressure to make sure that the beach ball does not fall to the ground. That is your task. So um, your challenge is see if you can walk across a room first, right? Kind of work out all the kinks. And then once you've done that, explore the entire first floor of your house. Once you've done that successfully, time yourself. So the entire first floor of your house in a minute with the beach ball between you never touching the ground. See if you can do that. 
or see what your best time is and try and improve on that each time. Anyway, I hope that these are fun activities for you and I hope that you continue exploring STEAM in every possible way. There's so many neat activities out there to do and to explore and you never know, it might lead you to the job that you want to do or it might lead you to explore in your job or in your school day what you do that's already STEAM related. So good luck and I hope to see you at the library. Hi, I'm Cassie Perkins and I made this Lego maze. Hi, I'm Mariah Ilsley, the Education and Group Coordinator for the Patriots Hall of Fame presented by Raytheon Technologies. In my job, I schedule and teach field trips. I work with the committee that selects the Patriots Hall of Fame Massachusetts STEM Teacher of the Year. We want, run a robust summer reading program, and sometimes I get to participate in really cool events like your STEAM night. But really what this means is that I have to understand all of the ways that science, technology, engineering, art, and math come together in the game of football. The understanding is important so that when we have field trips come to the Hall of Fame, we can have really exciting and interesting educational experiences. We generally see upwards of 20,000 students each year who participate in one of our eight field trips. These field trips focus on a wide array of the science, technology, engineering, art, and math in football and in the Patriots organization. And some of our more popular programs deal with things like security technology, where the students look at different types of security systems and make a recommendation on the best one for Gillette Stadium. Team management, where the students build a proposal from the ground up for an NFL expansion team including drafting players, building a stadium, and designing a logo, all while staying under budget. We deal with sports journalism and marketing. We talk about technologies used in sports. The most popular program is about player safety and the design of football helmets. We look at models starting all the way back with this leather head from the late 18 and early 1900s up to the new Rydell Speed Flex, which you'll see a lot of players wearing on the field today. We look at how the technology and designs have changed and then use that information to create new helmet prototypes. This program is what your activity is modeled after. I have built a prototype of a helmet that should disperse energy and cushion the impact. Let's see if it works. When you are ready to test, what you'll want to do is build what we call a brand. So you'll see our brains today have pasta in them, little pieces of ziti. You'll want three along the outside, two on the bottom of the bowl. And you're going to place this on the ground, preferably on a hard surface, not a thing carpeted. Once it's on the ground, you'll place your helmet design inside of that. Once that's on the ground, you'll want to find something that will provide an impact for your helmet. At the Hall of Fame, we use croquet balls. This ball is a, just under one pound. You can really use whatever you want. Think about using a softball or a baseball, or you know, if you want to be creative, use an apple or an onion, anything along those lines, as long as it does not exceed one pound in weight. So when you're ready to test, as you know, we have our helmet on the ground inside of our brain. You're gonna hold whatever you're using to provide impact straight out from your shoulder directly above your helmet design and then you'll count down from three. So three, two, one. Now let's see how I did. So a couple pieces fell out of my design but if we look at all of the pasta You'll notice that all of the pieces are still intact, which means that we would consider this a, su a successful design instead of being a redesign. As you build your prototype, think about how you can use the materials that you are provided. What are the properties of the materials? Do they change? Can you fold them, cut them, layer them? What do you need to do to make the best possible helmet prototype? Good luck. Have fun. Hi everyone, we are at our first STEAM Night giveaway. So whether you are watching it live or on demand, you have until December 1st to fill out the form to be entered in to win. Our first giveaway is a special STEAM prize pack. We have an amazing marble run and a fairy jar. So if you're interested, please 
fill out the form and the secret code is STEAM. So the secret code is STEAM only for the giveaway number one. Our other giveaways will have their separate secret codes. So head on over to my website and fill out the form and good luck. It's Mrs. Cameron again. Um, so for this project, um, it's a really simple, fun way to make something special. And um, we are creating popsicle stick picture frames. So I figured with the holiday season approaching us, this might be a really great way to make something meaningful for someone. And then you have all of your shopping already done. Thanks, Steam Night. Okay, so um, here's what a finished product look like, looks like, um, and here's a picture of a dog that we found. Um, not our dog, because we don't have a dog, but a cute picture of a dog. And you can put whatever picture you want inside, maybe a picture of whoever it is that you're giving the present to, if you want to do that. Um, and, you know, maybe you have a pet that you want to put a picture in for them. Okay, and then on um, here's another example that um, I made with my son. Both of my examples have been made with my three-year-old. Um, and, uh, and this just shows that there's a back, and then you would slip the picture right in the little um, space right there. So we used a hot glue gun for this, and I glued, and he stuck everything together, and then designed it. Um, but you can also use different types of glue, too. It's really whatever works for you. So you want to start with a simple square frame. Um, I like to measure it out just by kind of eyeballing it first to make sure that everything is going to fit. And then I remove one side and then I will put the hot glue down. I'm going to try doing this while filming. Um, so you want to put the hot glue on each side or whatever glue you're using. And then you put the stick right on top and you press down gently not too much because you don't want the glue going everywhere and then you do the same for the top if you're using hot glue it dries, it dries really quickly if you're using regular glue you might need to do this in stages and i did it on top of a newspaper so that way um the glue doesn't get everywhere once you have your basic frame ready to go, then you can see how you want to design to design the top. And I am just going to do a simple um, added layer. I'm going to have them be in a little bit, pushed in a little bit, so that way it shows um, just like some style. And same thing, I kind of eyeball it first, and then I'll go back and I will put my glue at the edge. And then I put my popsicle stick gently pushing down so the glue doesn't ooze everywhere, and then I do the same for the other side. And I'm the kind of person that likes everything to be kind of even, so I'm going to put another um, couple of popsicle sticks on the top and the bottom, so that way it frames out like this. All right, and there is the basic frame. Um, and you can see that there's a little space, and that's where you will sneak in your picture. I'm gonna let it dry for a minute or two um, and I'm going to add a little back. You don't really have to add much of a back but I like to just in case sometimes pictures bend over time um, so you can add as many popsicle sticks on the back as you want. For this one I'm just going to add one basic popsicle stick on the back. All right so there you have it. There's your basic picture frame. You'll be able to sneak a picture right in um, and now comes the super fun part where you get to decorate it. So whatever craft supplies you have available um, you can use, you can um, use pom-poms and markers like us, or if you have any kind of glitter or sequins, um, pipe cleaners, whatever it is that um, makes you excited. And um, you can also personalize it if you want to write something, someone's name on it, or if you want to say like happy holidays or happy birthday or something like that. Um, that's also a great idea too. So afterwards then you can put it on display and um or wrap it up and give it to someone as a present i hope you enjoy doing this project and i cannot wait to see what you come up with
Hello, I'm Officer Talitha Connor. I'm going to talk to you today about fingerprints. So police use fingerprints to identify people. We all have fingerprints. Everyone's fingerprints are different, and no two people have the same fingerprint. There are three different types of fingerprints, loops, whorls, and arches. <clears throat> the majority of the population has a loop pattern on their fingerprints. But today, in your kit, you received an index card, a magnifying glass, and an ink pad. What you're going to do is you're going to take your ink pad, put your finger on the ink pad, so you get a little bit of ink on there. Then on your index card, you're going to put your fingerprint right on it. And there's your fingerprint. With your magnifying glass, you can look at your fingerprint and see what kind of fingerprints you have if you have loops, whorls, or arms. Hey everybody, my name is Miss Melanie and I work at the Children's Museum in Easton. And what I do is I'm an outreach teacher. So I go into schools for the museum and teach about STEM and STEAM things because I love science and we do fun projects and experiments and it's my favorite job I've ever had. So that's what I do. And what I'm here today to talk to you about is one of my favorite subjects, magnets. Who doesn't love magnets, right? What's not to love? I mean, there are these metals or, or rocks that create an invisible field around themselves and that's called a magnetic field. It's almost like magic, but it's not magic, it's science. And this magnetic field is concentrated around the magnet's south and north poles. South pole, north pole. Sounds like the Earth. Well, guess what? The Earth is a giant magnet. The metal core inside the Earth is always rotating. And that rotation of those metal elements inside the Earth creates this wonderful magnetic field that isn't just cool, it also protects us on Earth from harmful radiation. So it's great that the Earth is a giant magnet, right? So magnets, like the two I have here, which I made out of magnet pieces and put them on craft sticks, also have North and South Poles. Now, when you attach them together, the North Poles are attracted to the South Poles. But I don't know if you've done this before, you probably have. If you place two magnets together, it's really hard to get the North Poles to touch the North Poles because they don't like each other. They're repelled by each other. So North Poles like South Poles, and that goes for mostly all magnets. And I'll give you a demonstration of this with my floating magnets that I have here, okay? They're all attracted to the opposite poles, but when I switch the poles, attracted, repelled. And you can do this with mostly any magnet that you have. See how when the magnets are facing the wrong poles, they repel each other, floating magnets. So not everybody has floating magnets at home, but maybe you have some kind of a magnet that you can use on a popsicle stick or just by itself. And what you can do to experiment with magnets is to see what they like to attract. Well, here's a hint. It's probably metal, as you know, but what kinds of metal? Not all metals are attracted to magnets. So you can do an experiment. I have a bowl of jingle bells. Well, it likes those jingle bells, which means that they're probably made of something that magnets like. Iron, cobalt, nickel. Some metals don't contain a lot of those metals, some objects, so they're not really attracted to them that much. Now you would think, since magnets love nickels, well, I bet you magnet's gonna love a nickel. Guess what? Nickels aren't made of nickel that much anymore. They're made of usually copper 
and some nickel. So it doesn't work on everything. But if you try to attach paper fasteners, for instance, well, magnets love paper fasteners. What else can we try them on? Tacks? Oh, definitely, they love tacks. Which usually means that there's something in those materials, like, let's say, paper clips, that either has iron, nickel, or steel, or some combination. Use what you have at home. Here's a refrigerator magnet. I bet you, you have those at home. And you can try and see if that works. Form a hypothesis. See what kind of materials you have that you think a, metal, a magnet would attract. Place them out. See what they do. Experiment. I bet you'll find some interesting things. But whatever you do, keep loving science. Keep doing your STEM. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Mario Garcia. Hello, I'm Olive Mulaney. And today we decided to paint Birdhouse's first theme wreath. It wasn't on the choice board, but there was like one where you could like pick your own idea. So we got so, these at Michael's. Yeah. So we got all these colors that you can tell, and we got brushes. We have more, but we're just going to use these for now. So we're going to show you the painting process. Okay, now that we have looked online for some ideas, I think we both have some good choices, I guess. I mean, I'm just going to so, go for it. I'm just going to go wild. And I'm deciding to go for a full pastel birdhouse. So. so here the mixing view, and I'm doing this pastel blue before, and then I'm gonna do yellow and pink, and maybe a little bit of purple I if I can mix them. So yeah, this is my color, and I'm gonna start now. It's a beautiful white fence, I think. And this is my blue safari. It's really bright. Out. <laughs> Oh, hi. Thanks so much for joining me in my studio today. My name is Matt Shearer, formerly known as Producer Matt on 103.3 Amp Radio, currently known as Reporter Matt on WBZ News Radio 1030. That's right. I'm a news reporter now. And I know what you're thinking. He doesn't look like a reporter. Where's the tie? Well, I don't have to wear a tie because I'm on the radio. I get to wear whatever I want. So you'll see me in hoodies and comfort clothes all day. It's pretty awesome. But as a matter of fact, let's walk through my day to day so that you can get a sense of what it is that I do, starting with the assignment. That's the first thing that happens in the morning. I talk to my editor and they tell me what my assignment is today. They say, hey, this thing is happening in this town. Go report on it for us. And I say, okay. And first things first, before I even leave the house, research. I have to actually look up the details of the story and the facts so that when I show up to report on it, I don't look like a fool. I'm not just some random person on the street with a microphone. I'm somebody who knows what they're talking about. God, if, if how am I supposed to inform you of the story if I'm not informed myself, right? Then once I feel like I'm all up to speed on everything and I know all the people involved and the details of the story, I book it. That means I got to get my interview all squared away. I reach out to the people involved in the story and I say, hey, can I interview you? Usually they say yes. People are like, yeah, I want to be on the radio, of course. So once I have my interview booked, boom, get to it. I got to head out on the road and go to wherever the story may be. I can't just be reporting on it from my room here. How can I talk about what a protest looks like or how a meeting went if I'm just sitting next to my bookshelf and my guitar here. I have to be there. So that's why I go. Once I get the interview done, once I get a sense of what's happening on the scene, that's when I sit down at my computer and write. I have to write my story because I want, unlike right now where I have nothing written down, if I'm going to be doing a news report, I want to have it all written out so that I know exactly what I'm going to be saying into the microphone in a nice, clear, concise way. Because that's the other big thing. I could be doing a 45-minute interview out there, but I have to boil that down to 45 seconds for the radio, for the news. That's because we try to get as much news as we possibly can on the air so that people can be as informed about as many topics as we can possibly fit into our short amount of time. So 45 seconds is my goal. And that's where this comes in, the editing phase. I basically turn my, uh, my car into a mobile editing studio. I have my laptop in my lap. 
that's hooked up to an audio interface, which is one of those cool looking things with a ton of buttons and knobs. And I plug in a microphone into that and I just do everything that I can to get the sound quality just right. I also want to have the sounds out on the street of whatever event I was at. So let's say I was covering a story in a park, right? At a playground. I want the sounds of the kids and the swings and the seesaws and the slides. I'm going to add all that underneath my voice so that it sounds like the listener is there with me. One of the great things about radio is we get to play with the theater of the mind. We're basically using the audio to paint a picture in somebody's head of what it is that we're looking at. I need to do my best job as a reporter to tell that story since they can't see it. Once all of that editing is done and once I feel like I've really done a great job of giving somebody a visual of what the story is, boom, just got to send it. I send it off to the radio station and it's up to them where they put it in the newscast. And all I got to do is then drive home with the radio set to WBZ News Radio 1030 and I hear my voice. And I got to say, that's the most rewarding thing about my job is going out, working so hard on an assignment and then hearing it on the radio. Oh, it's just such a special, rewarding thing to have. So thank you so much for allowing me to speak at Steam Night. It's so cool that it's being done virtually today. There's so much science and technology involved with what I do for a living. Like I said, I've got the microphones. I've got the recorders. I've got everything. And from what I understand, you are going to be doing a very similar assignment yourself, making a microphone. So thanks again for tuning in. Hello and welcome to Battleground Games and Hobbies, your friendly local game store and your source for board games, card games, miniature games, and role-playing games. Also, a location where you can find innumerable great entertaining ways to engage in STEAM activities with your friends and family. For everybody from the very young to the very old, games are a fantastic opportunity to practice STEAM skills and learn new things. Some games are great for practicing memory and concentration. There are also games that are fantastic for pattern recognition. Or you could play games that concentrate on engineering skills, building structures to learn about mass, volume, and weight. More advanced games like role-playing games offer basic mathematics. 20! That's a critical hit! That means I'm going to do 2d8 plus 2 bludgeoning damage. 12 damage! Take that, kobold! And some games even introduce elements of rudimentary algebra. Okay, I'm gonna tap all of my Urza's lands. I have a tower, so that's three mana. The power plant is two, and the mine is two, so I have seven mana. If I cast my Hangerback Walker for six, that means it's going to enter the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it. From an artistic perspective, many games encourage you to customize your figures, introducing elements of painting and color design. And beyond that, role-playing games often involve a lot of storytelling and creativity. Above and beyond all of that, however, gaming is all about learning new systems, formulating strategies, and trying out different ways to overcome obstacles. It's all about learning to think. It's all about science. So when you think STEAM, think about games. They're a fantastic way to train your brain to think. They're how you learn to learn.
we're at our second Steam Night giveaway, and this is our Battlegrounds prize pack. So we have a $20 gift card to Battlegrounds in Abington, so you can get your own super cool game from there. And the secret code is BATTLE. So head on over to my website and fill out the form, and make sure you toss in the secret code BATTLE, and good luck. I hope you win. Mrs. Cameron, STEAM teacher. So we are making a festive, fun turkey. I figured since Thanksgiving is coming up and um, also turkeys all, all around us, um, I figured it'd be really fun if we could make some turkeys. So you're going to need some coffee filters. Um, the ones that look like this work best for this. Um, we found brown ones um, because there weren't any white ones, but I actually really like the brown ones because they go really well with the turkey, so it works out. Um, and you're going to want to flatten it. So once you have it flattened, then you can draw on it. Um, I wanted to do colors that are similar. Um, they're all, are all kind of near each other on the color wheel. Um, and I did it so that they were also turkey colors too. Um, you want to have the colors be similar so that way when they start bleeding together, they kind of all work together and look nicely. Okay, so um, you don't have to be perfect with your coloring. As you can see, I totally just messed up on this example. Coloring, excuse me. Coloring uh, while holding a camera is not very easy. Um, oh yes, all right, so my three-year-old wanted to show you his. This is what his looks like. We're gonna spray his in a minute. Um, and you just add colors in any way that you want to. I'm gonna make mine into kind of stripes like this um, and you want to have the colors near each other but not over each other um, and you can design whatever you want. Once you have your coffee filter um, all colored then you're going to put it on a plate and you'll put um, you'll, you're going to want a plate that um, can get wet so paper plate probably isn't the best bet and then you're going to spray it down. So I have a spray bottle here um, or if you have a mister or something like that, um, you want to spray it down so it gets nice and wet and you can see the colors are starting to blend and you can also tell Daddy, that Mama. my plate has a ridge because it's forming a little circle of okay. the marker colors. So you want to let your coffee filter dry um, or you can um, use a hairdryer on it. Just make sure um, if you're one of the littlest Vikings, you have a parent permission before you start using hairdryer. Um, so you want to dry it out. And once it's all dry, then you have um, a really pretty spiral or whatever design that you did. And you'll take it and you'll fold it in half. The more um, marker you use, the more the colors will be vibrant. And again, we use the brown filters, so they're going to have kind of a brown hue. If you use the white filters, the, um, they'll be brighter. Um, and we use these skinny markers. If you have thicker markers or markers that always have a lot of ink coming out, then um, you'll also get more color that way. It's really up to you. So for our last step, you need your clothespins. You're gonna decorate your clothespins to look like turkey heads. Um, so as you can see, this one was made by my three-year-old and this one was made by me. And um, you can be as fancy as you want to. If you wanna add googly eyes, if you have construction paper, you wanna make it bigger than just a clothespin, you can really do whatever you want. I just decided to stick with markers for this, um, but really, like if you have other types of supplies and you wanna really build them out, add some sparkles, whatever it is, go for it. And um, after you're done, you're going to take your coffee filter and you'll put the coffee filter right on the clothespin. And then you have a cute little decoration, um, awesome for a uh, centerpiece or um, decoration for Thanksgiving, or if you're looking to celebrate turkeys, um, this is a great way to do that. Okay, so science behind this is um, the washable markers that we use 
is acts as the solute and the water acts as the solvent. So when the, the filter that's covered with all of the different um, marker colors, when it gets wet, it makes the ink start um, moving all around because the water is um, soaking the coffee filter. And once the water starts moving, then it um, dies into uh, the other colors and makes it look super cool. When the co coffee filter dries, then it stays as whatever um, the design ended up being when um, all the uh, water and everything moved around. All right, so have a great time making these turkeys and I can't wait to see what you make. My name is Eli and I actually made three um, secret entrances. So my first secret entrance is in a house. This, I forget what it's called. You might think that it's a it's a secret door. These, once you do at least these ones, you're going to think you're just going to give up. But actually, if you go to this one, you go down further, and my second secret entrance um, actually has to be, it has to be nighttime. Then I go right here, I go to sleep, then leave the bed. I wake up inside of this house, and then there's this to get out, but nothing to get back in. Then I have one more, which is over here. You might think that does something. It doesn't actually do something. You think... That you make them think that this is the secret entrance, but it's not really, and they know that it's not even to try. And they see the button, they press the button, but nothing happens. But what? That's what they want. That's what I want them to do. I want them to think that this isn't really the right thing going in then just to keep it there I did that so that is all my um those are all my secret trap doors hello everyone my name is Kyle Kamara I am a merchant marine I graduated from Massachusetts Maritime Academy um, in 2015 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Marine Transportation. Basically what my job entitles me is to keep a safe navigational launch on vessels that travel among the oceans. Um, so these vessels range from anywhere between 500 uh, feet to 1,000 feet. Uh, I'm usually out for three months at a time. Uh, sometimes I can be longer, sometimes it can be less, but on average I'm three months on, three months off. Um, what I do is I keep a safe navigational watch on the oceans and what that entitles me to do is to make sure that our position is where we're at when we follow our voyage plan to go to the next port to either discharge our cargoes or load our cargoes. Um, in doing that, we use a lot of terrestrial and celestial navigation and what that entitles us to do is to take bearings off of land or objects off of land like lighthouses, lights, or the celestial part where we could use stars, planets, moon, sun um, to make sure that we're in the precise position at a certain time in conjunction with the uh, GPS that we use to keep us uh, on our track line. Um, basically what I do from day to day is I stand these watches for four hours at a time, uh, making sure that we're safe and doing uh, maneuvering in the open oceans or when we're near coastal areas uh, where the traffic is a lot higher. Um, but I also make sure that the ship is uh, maintained for 
um, quality, um, make sure that the paint's not rusting or the cargoes aren't leaking into the uh, ocean or um, the cargoes are secured to the deck at all times. Um, but my primary job is for the safe navigation of the ship. Um, I also oversee the loading and discharging of the cargoes. Um, right now I load crude oil usually in the Gulf of Mexico and bring it up to the Northeast and they refine that crude oil into products that we get at the gas station or gas or any types of uh, petroleum products that we use uh, for our day to day lives. Um, basically, uh, today we're gonna do a job, a little project um, where we use some aluminum foil uh, in a bowl of water and we're gonna try to make a boat and make it float. Um, the aluminum foil has to be 12 inches by 12 inches um, and you can use any type of weights. Right now I'm using change. You can use anything else that has a little bit of weight to it. But we wanna see what, how many, how much weight we can put on the aluminum foil before it can sink. Now, what I do usually on the ship is we usually load the ship with crude oil and we wanna make sure that we load the ship evenly. So we don't wanna load into one tank on one side of the ship and make it list to one side. And we don't wanna load it too far back or too far forward because then you'll tilt the ship forward or back. Um, so basically you wanna make sure that the heavy stuff like the bigger coins, the bigger weights stays kind of in the middle and the lighter stuff or the lighter coins like the pennies and dimes or anything that's a little lighter for your weight that you're using to stay on the outside. But you also just want to make sure that when you load it, you want to load it so it stays even and it, and it actually goes into the water evenly. Inside Storm Team 5. And now, Storm Team 5 Chief Meteorologist Harvey Leonard, Meteorologist Cindy Fitzgibbon, Meteorologist Kellyanne Chicalese, and Meteorologist Mike Wongo. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're taking you behind the scenes here at WCVB Channel 5 so you can learn more about how we forecast New England's ever changing weather. We'll show you some of the tools we use to put our forecast together. Explain just what goes into making a forecast and show you how we bring that forecast to you on television every morning, every night, on weekends, and around the clock. Forecasting New England weather is the ultimate challenge. We get everything from rain to snow, nor'easters to hurricanes. You name it, we can get it right here. And Harvey's seen it all. He's been forecasting New England weather on television for more than 40 years. That's a lot of storms. Forecasting the weather is a science, the science of meteorology. Harvey, Mike, Cindy, and I all went to school to study this science, and we all have degrees in it. It's not just a job, it's something we love to do. I've wanted to do this since I was in the sixth grade. And this is where it all begins, right here in the Storm Team 5 Weather Center. See these computers? Well, we look at them all day long. Without them, weather forecasting as we know it would not be possible. Now, these aren't ordinary computers like you might use at home or at school. They're getting data from a satellite dish outside the studio, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Everything from temperatures to wind speed and direction to satellite and radar images from all over the world. We look at this information to see what is going on right now. This is called an observation. 
We also look at pictures taken from space to show us where the clouds are. Here, we've just taken a bunch of these pictures and put them together into a series called a satellite loop. And radars can show us where the snow and rain are falling from these clouds. We take those images and make them into a movie we call a radar loop. Here at WCVB Channel 5, we have our very own radar that's based out of Hawkington. It's scanning the skies every minute of every day, ready to track those storms and to help us keep you safe. So now that we've made our observations, we're ready to make a forecast, right? Not so fast. You see, our atmosphere is like a cake made of lots of layers. We've only figured out what's going on on the bottom layer where we live. We need to figure out what's going on on all those layers all the way to the top before we can make a forecast. So how do we figure out what the weather's doing above our heads? Well, have you ever heard of a weather balloon? They've been taking upper air observations since the 1930s, two times every day, from about 100 locations across the country. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration launched these balloons into the atmosphere where they measure temperature, humidity, pressure, and winds from just above the ground to 20 miles high in the sky. And all that information gets plotted on weather charts like these, so meteorologists across the country can analyze the data. Now that we've got a handle on what the atmosphere is doing right now, we're ready to predict what it will do in the future. This is called a forecast. Now we make forecasts from a few hours all the way out to seven days into the future. Technology has improved a lot over the years. It is advanced so that weather forecasting today is largely based on what's called computer models. These rely on complex math equations that mimic the way the atmosphere behaves. They take in all the observations of the current state of the atmosphere and calculate how different parameters will change from hours to days out into the future. It would take a person days to solve those math equations, but high-powered supercomputers can do more than 1,000 trillion calculations a second. Now, there are many models to look at, and they update multiple times a day. Meteorologists learn how to analyze and interpret these weather models to guide us in making our forecasts every day. Now that we know the forecast, we need to be able to show the forecast. And to do that, we need to make the weather graphics you see on TV. Every map and graphic you see us standing in front of or pointing at, we make on these computers. But what you see at home on your TV set isn't what we see here in the studio. Come on, I'll show you. We stand in front of this green wall we call the chroma key. It makes us magically appear in front of our weather maps. Here's how it works. The technical director back in the control room places the green wall with the graphics we make in our weather computers. The result is you see a meteorologist with a weather map behind us. All we see is a big green wall. We have to look at these TV screens to know where we point. We could have another one tonight. See this remote? Well, this button changes the graphics, but if we press this button, we can actually interact with the map. We can draw on it if we want to, or we can take the map and grab it and say, oh, I'd like to talk about this area here or that area there. Or in addition to that, we can hide things on our weather maps. So let's say we had a seven day forecast up and I wanted to talk a little bit more about this day. I could actually break it out and talk more about it, but we have to be careful not to wear green on TV or else part of us will disappear. So, what do you think? A little harder than it looks, isn't it? And we've just scratched the surface. What do you say we talk some science? Let's dig a little deeper into New England weather. Hi, my name is Mackenzie, and I'm a Tower Elf Cup. Hi, I'm Linda Terizio, and I am one of the owners with my husband Steve of Tangerini Spring Street Farm in Millis, Massachusetts. We are a 65 acre organic fruit and vegetable farm. We have five ducks over here. These are our five ducks. And then we also have about 45 chickens over in this pen. And we have two goats. Uh, we have Butter, who's coming over to say hello. And we have Tabasco up here, a black and white one on top of the rocks. The goats and the chickens actually live really, really nicely together. The goats 
will help to protect the chickens and uh, keep away any predators. We have three red-tailed hawk that live here on our farm and the red-tailed hawk will really easily swoop down and grab one of these chickens and the goats tend to scare them away and deter them from doing that. So right now we're taking a little bit of a walk around one of our fields on the farm here. At our farm here, we grow about 75 different varieties of fruits and vegetables. We grow everything from lettuce and kale and uh, all of the greens that you can think of to your summer vegetables of corn and tomatoes, eggplant and peppers. And then we grow a lot of different winter crops as well. Um, we grow a lot of things that we call storage crops. So the storage crops are like carrots and potatoes, onions and uh, parsnips, rutabaga, beets, um, all of these things store really well for the winter months. So here at this first field that we're coming to, um, we have some of our lettuce. We're actually harvesting some of this lettuce right now, which is why you see so many empty holes. So all of our lettuce plantings, we actually plant on plastic. We call them plastic beds. So we cover this ground with plastic. This plastic is a compostable plastic that is actually biodegradable. It will, it will break down right into the soil at the end of the season. And uh, the plastic helps to keep the ground underneath of it, the, the plastic um, warm when it gets cold out. It kind of keeps in some of the heat like a blanket. And then it also keeps some of the weeds out of growing in between the lettuce. Next over here, we have our strawberry plants. So these strawberry plants here are growing right now. We planted these in June and July, and they're growing now. And then pretty soon in November, we're going to cover them with straw. And then they basically get tucked in and pretty much go to sleep for the winter. So they stop growing. And then in the springtime, when the temperature gets warmer, we will uncover them and uh, they will start to blossom and produce some wonderfully delicious strawberries. Over here are some of our blueberry bushes. So we have several different varieties of blueberries here at the farm. We grow peaches, blueberries, apples, strawberries, and uh, some melons for all of our fruit here. This is one of our storage crops. And I bet some of you can guess what this is right here. So these will get a little bit closer. These are carrots. So these carrots got planted in July and they have been growing really nicely in this soil. It's been really dry this year. So we've been having to irrigate, which means we've been watering this with uh, an overhead, basically like a really big sprinkler. Hi everybody, I'm Mrs. Barrasso. I'm the Director of Student Activities. Um, we do Little Viking Summer Institute, Homework Club, and um, the after school activities. So hopefully I'll be seeing you all soon. Uh, in the meantime, I'm happy to jump in on Steam Week and let you know um, what I had one of my little friends from Little Viking Summer Institute help me make. So this is a pop bottle sailboat. So all you're going to do is take a bottle of soda or a bottle of water and you're going to cut it in half. And we used a big popsicle stick. Um, we did felt for the sail. And we put some rocks in here. So if you want to make this and you put the rocks in here, you can see if you can get your boat to sail. So something easy, something inexpensive, and a cute little project that anybody can make. So I hope you have fun watching this video. And if you make something like this, let me know. I want to see. Take care. Bye. 
Hi everyone, we are at our third giveaway for STEAM Night, and this is the East Bridgewater Gear Prize Pack. So if you would like to show your Viking pride, then this is the prize for you. All sorts of different things from um, sweatshirts to shirts, and, um, and some are from Little Vikings, and some are from the high school. So if you are interested, please put the secret code VIKINGS into the form on my website. So once again, the secret code is VIKINGS. Vikings. Good luck. Um, for this project, we are making salt leaf crystals. And um, you're going to need to go find some leaves Maybe some bright fall leaves that you uh, that have fallen off some trees that you can find on the ground. And then you're going to want to boil some water. I have some water boiling right here. And once you have the water boiling, you actually want to turn off the water and take it off the heat like that. And then pour a whole bunch of salt in it. So you want to pour so much salt that there's it's very, very filled with salt. So you wanna have so much salt that you can see the salt and it's gritty on the bottom and it might even make a layer of salt on the top. So you wanna have a bunch of it. The more salt you have, the more crystals you're going to make. So let's see if that's enough. You can feel it on the bottom, but it's still mixing in. Once your pot is filled with lots of salty water, then you want to pour them into some glass containers. I have a mason jar and a cup right here. See how salty they are? And now you want to attach your leaves to a little clip. And then you'll put your leaves in your cups, into the salt, and let them stay there and then you'll watch to see what happens and usually in about an hour you can start telling that the crystals are forming but in order for them to get really crystally you want to wait a few days two days is probably the minimum but if you wait even longer like four days they can get really crystally so when you are boiling the water, it makes the particles in the water heat up. And when they heat up, they separate. So when you put in all of the salt and you pour so much that it's oversaturated, um, it makes room for a lot of salt to be able to add into the water, which is why it gets so cloudy. And then by adding even more salt and making it gritty and you can hear it on the bottom and there's a little layer on the top, that's when you know you have enough salt. And when the water starts to cool um, on the leaves or in your cups, um, then the particles start slowing down again and the salt falls out of place. And um, this makes it so they form large crystals and um, kind of stick to whatever is close by, which in this case is the leaves. Um, and that's what makes a really cool looking um, crystals and it kind of looks like ice maybe. So you can do this project in many different ways. Um, you can use real life leaves like we did. Um, you can use construction paper um, or pipe cleaners. You can have it in cups or you can also have it on a plate. Like if you have um, the paper or leaves or pipe cleaners flat on the plate and then um, you put them into the water if the plate has like a little dip in it you can also do it that way um, and that actually might take less time than the four days that it will take me to see the crystals form and when you want um, when you're all done and you want to um, start forming those crystals you want to put them in a place where the water will evaporate so a sunny window is a great spot or somewhere that tends to be warm you don't want it to be in a cold area or like a damp basement or anything because then it won't take it will take a long time and it won't really work as fast as you want it to 
So have fun. Um, I can't wait to see what you create with your families and maybe you can use this as a nice centerpiece for any of the upcoming holidays that you're celebrating. So after about six days of the leaf being in the cup with the salt water, I took it out and I laid it down on the plate and it dried out and you can see that it looks so pretty with all the different crystals, salt crystals on it. Um, and as you know, I had made two um, cups with the salt water in it, but the other cup just didn't end up working. And then I ended up spilling. So um, and this one looks so pretty. Be nice for a awesome centerpiece um, or for decorating um, or just for doing it for fun. So I can't wait to see what you guys come up with and make sure that you hashtag great to be a Viking. Hi, I made a Scott pyramid. It has um, four skinny for Rose. Bye. We want to Captain Kelly from the fire department here to talk to you about uh, how science applies to what we do here in the fire industry. Uh, fire is a science, believe it or not, uh, starting with how it's put together. Um, fire involves three things. It's uh, fuel, heat, and oxygen. You put those three things together, you get what's called a chemical reaction, and that is how a fire actually develops. Um, so fuel can be anything from wood, paper, um, I mean, the wax in this candle in front of me, the wick in this candle in front of me, those are all the fuels. The heat came from a spark of a lighter and the oxygen is readily available all around us. So again, that makes the fire triangle, which we have right here. All right, again, fuel, heat, and oxygen. And conversely for us to put a fire out as firefighters, we take one of those sides of that fire triangle away and the fire goes out. So if we wanted to take the fuel away from say this candle, we would just let it kind of burn itself out. Once all the wax is gone, then the fire will go out. If we wanted to take the oxygen away, which is the optimal way to put the, out this candle fire, we would just cover the top of it and smother that fire. Um, and the worst way to actually put this fire would be to actually spray water on it. We don't want to do that because we could blow the wax around and we could uh, burn somebody. So in terms of how we fight fires as firefighters, it really depends on the science behind the fire and uh, why it's burning. Uh, another example would be a grease fire in a kitchen. We don't want to be uh, spraying water on that because, again, it would spread the fire because water and oil don't mix. Right? So water actually will push the oil around. It could spread the fire to the cabinets or uh, other parts of the kitchen, uh, causing the fire to intensify. So again, if we have a grease fire in a kitchen, we want to take the oxygen away in, in terms of that fire by covering up with the uh, lid of a pan or a giant baking sheet. But again, just to show you, just put the lid right on top, take the oxygen away, that fire goes out. Um, some more science that we have in the fire service here, we have what's called our thermal imaging. So this camera right here allows us to detect heat signatures uh, to find, could be missing firefighters, could be uh, victims inside of a fire, uh, could be hidden fires as well. It could be behind walls, it could be in the attics. So that tool, the thermal imaging camera, is a, a big tool for us uh, in terms of keeping us safe and helping us uh, preserve property and, and find the fire in general. Um, we also, in terms of how we ventilate structures uh, after a fire, we can use a uh, giant fan that we can put, uh, blow clean air into the house and all the, uh, the dirty air, the bad air, the smoke all blows out of the house as we open up windows strategically. Uh, we can also ventilate from inside the structure with our hose lines. Uh, we can use what's called a cone shape uh, from our nozzle and we can blow uh, spray water out of the window and in doing that, it actually creates a vortex. It pulls the dirty air out of the building and allows clean, clean air to come in behind it. Uh, in terms of the ambulance and, and the science we have in the ambulance, we have cardiac monitoring. As you can see right here, up here is a normal heart rate. <clears throat> That's basically your heart firing. Your atrium and your ventricles all firing together to create that nice heart rate. And what this uh, cardiac monitor does, it measures, it measures electrical signals of the heart to tell us whether it's beating healthy or not. And conversely, if it's not beating healthy, you could see a cardiac rhythm, kind of like the one up here now. That's called ventricular fibrillation. Basically, the heart is shaking like a bowl of jello. And we would do pretty much a control alt delete. We put the pads on the patient and we would do what's called defibrillate, which is a sudden uh, stop and reset of the heart in hopes of getting back to that normal sinus rhythm, which would, you would see right here. Now, what can you do at home and relates uh, to fire service and uh, to keeping yourself safe? You can practice fire drills at home. 
in schools, we do several fire drills throughout the year, but this year is kind of different. Uh, we have hybrid learning, we have remote learning, and um, to be frank, we should be doing fire drills at home in general. Uh, the chance of being in a fire at home is a lot greater than being in a, in a fire at school. So we should practice our fire drills at home. We should have a home escape plan, know where our meeting spot is once we get outside the house. Uh, and we should know that once everybody's at that meeting spot, we stay out of there. It doesn't matter if our favorite toy is inside, it doesn't matter if we're missing a sibling inside. Once we get out, we stay out. Another way you can, thing you can do is check your smoke and CO detectors in your house. Make sure that they operate uh, properly. Make sure that you change the batteries uh, when you change your clocks. And also we can make sure that uh, we know what they sound like. All right. So I appreciate, let me take time to make this video for you in terms of how science relates to us in the fire service. Any questions, you can always contact us here at the fire department. We're always happy to help out. Thank you very everybody. much. everybody. My name is Ann Kerrigan, and I'm the assistant director at East Bridgewater Community Access Media, your local public access station here in East Bridgewater. And today, I would like to show you how to make a fairy jar. So I'm going to show you how to put this fairy jar together. And what you do with this fairy jar, once it's all complete, is you put a little battery operated tea light candle, never a real flame inside, and then it glows really nicely and you can see your fairy on the front. The supplies that you're going to need to make your fairy jar, you can use a canning jar or any kind of recycled jar, some tissue paper, iridescent glitter if you have it, if you don't, any kind of glitter that you would like to use is going to look pretty. Some white glue, twine, and a little disposable brush uh, that you can just throw away when you're done because you're gonna get glue all over it. And if you want to put a fairy cutout inside your jar, like I have one in here, you can just trace your own fairy cutout or you could draw some stars or maybe a moon or whatever you'd like. And you know what? If you don't wanna glue something in there, that's absolutely fine too because look how pretty it is even without anything inside. And the first thing we're going to do is take the lid off of our jar. I have a little fairy here and I'm going to coat this fairy with glue and we are going to glue her into the inside of our jar. First, pour some glue onto a paper plate. Then use your brush to cover the fairy with glue on the black side. This is the side you want facing out. Press the fairy against the inside of the jar. Then cut some white tissue paper to fit the width of your jar. Now you want to cover the jar with glue, but don't cover the part where the lid screws on. Now take your tissue paper and lay it evenly around the jar. Cut off any extra tissue paper and glue down the seam. Then cover it all with more glue, even the bottom. Now sprinkle glitter over the entire jar. If you want to speed up the drying process, use a blow dryer set on low slash warm. Cut a length of twine and wrap it twice around the lip of the jar just below the lid. Tie into a bow. And now your fairy lantern is all done. If you want to put some decorations on the front of it, you could use pretty much whatever you'd like, whatever you have on hand. Flower, I found some little pine cones out in my backyard. You could use some pine cones. Um, I had some little, these are just some little fake berries that came with my fake flowers. <laughs> or if you wanted to use beads or seashells or whatever makes you happy, you could glue it right on the front there. Uh, usually you should use a glue gun, but only use that glue gun with mom and dad. I hope you've enjoyed making our fairy lanterns and everybody have a great day. Hi, my name's Olivia and for Steam Week I made fluffy slime. It's the same ingredients to make regular slime, except there's shaving cream and litter, and it's really fun to play with.
Hi everyone, this is State Representative Allison Sullivan, and I just want to take a moment to thank Ms. Cameron for giving me the opportunity to uh, make a video for her STEM and STEAM night. Um, I was looking forward to going to the Gordon Mitchell School like last year and seeing all the creative work that our students are doing. Unfortunately, this year has been a little different, um, and I want to take a moment to tell the children that are watching this video, you guys are doing such a great job. Uh, the teachers, you guys have been faced with things that you never even thought you would have to be faced with, um, whether it be hybrid learning, remote learning, you guys are doing such a great job. So continue doing that. We are very proud of you, proud of the students in East Bridgewater, proud of the teachers, so thank you. I also wanna say how important STEM and STEAM is. It's very important that we continue this work that Ms. Cameron is doing within East Bridgewater. And I look forward to hopefully being at the Gordon Mitchell School again next year. I wanna say God bless, be well, stay well and healthy, and see you guys all again next year. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Kruger. And I'm Matthew Kruger. And we're the owners of Missile Two Acres Tree Farm in East Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Today we're going to talk to you about measuring pH and why this is so important for the health of our Christmas trees. So what is pH? Well, the P stands for potential, or some people like to say power, and H stands for hydrogen. So pH has to do with the amount of hydrogen ions in a solution. If you're not sure what hydrogen ions mean, that's okay, you'll learn about that once you get to eighth grade. This is an image of the pH scale, which ranges from one to 14. As you can see, some items are lower on the pH scale, which means they're more acidic, like battery acid or lemons, and some items are higher on the pH scale, which means they're more alkaline or basic, so bleach and baking soda. And the items in the middle, around seven, are neutral. So why is testing pH important for Christmas tree farmers? Well, we have to constantly test the pH of our soil and of our water to make sure that our soil isn't too basic or too acidic for our plants. This is because Christmas trees or conifers don't like to grow in an environment that's too alkaline or too acidic. If the environment's too acidic, the trees tend to soak up too much manganese and aluminum, and that's actually really bad for our trees. But our conifers tend to like to be in soil that's a little bit more on the acidic side than neutral or alkaline, so they like an environment that's between pH of 5.5 and 6.5. There are lots of ways to test pH, but one way is by using these dipsticks. So this is a quick, easy way, not super accurate, but just accurate enough for the moment. I'm going to place these dipsticks into a solution of vinegar and also water. So the vinegar is on the left and the water's on the right. And we'll compare those to the pH chart, which ranges from zero to 13, to see how acidic or alkaline each of these substances are. So the vinegar you can see tested probably around a three or a four. So it's pretty acidic where the water tested right at a pH of seven. So great job East Bridgewater Water Department for keeping our drinking water safe. Here at the farm, we don't use dipsticks to test the pH of our soil and water. We actually pay a specialized company to come in and take a soil analysis for us. Did you know that carbon dioxide can actually cause water to become more acidic? That's because carbon dioxide, the stuff that we breathe out of our lungs and is a byproduct of fossil fuel, diffuses into water and creates something called carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid can change the pH of the water. This is an acid indicator solution called bromothymol blue. Notice it's blue color and it changes color when something becomes more acidic. So right now, this is indicating that the water is neutral. I'm actually going to blow carbon dioxide out of my lungs and into the bromothymol blue and you should see a color change as a result of that. Here we go. So it's easy to see here that the addition of carbon dioxide has made the water more acidic as indicated by the bromothymol blue solution. It turned yellow. Luckily for us here at the farm, there is something we can do about our soil when it's too acidic. So we can add something that's a little more basic or alkaline to neutralize the acidity in the soil. I'm going to demonstrate this in my carbonic acid solution here. Um, hopefully you'll see a change when I add something that's a little more neutral. So this is higher up on the uh, pH scale. So actually I should say it's a little more basic and I'm going to try to neutralize my acidic solution by adding something that's a little more basic like baking soda. So what we should see 
is an eventual color change back to blue. There we go. So although it's a little bit foamy, you can see that the bromothymol blue is indicating that this is not such an acidic solution anymore and that it is in fact more basic or neutral. So if I were to measure the pH of this, it should be somewhere right around seven now. And there you have it. At the tree farm, we add substances like lime to the soil in very careful amounts to help neutralize some of the acidity. We hope you enjoyed your Mistletoe Acres Tree Farm Science Lesson for Steam Night, and we look forward to catching up with everyone at the farm. Hi everyone, we are at our fourth and final giveaway for Steam Night. It is a gift card to Mistletoe Acres Tree Farm. Perfect timing because the Christmas season and holiday season is upon us. Uh, so if you would like to win this, then um, please put in the code TREES to giveaway number four on my website. So again, the code is TREES. Good luck. Hi, I'm Matt from Restoration Coffee. I'm gonna show you how to do a pour over at home. I'll show you a couple different things you need. You need coffee. You can have it ground at the coffee shop or you can grind it at home. You need a paper filter and a V60 device. You need some type of carafe to put the coffee in as it's brewing. You need a scale. You can pick one of these up at Target for $15, $20. And you need hot water. All right, I'll show you how this process goes together. So we're gonna start with the carafe in your V60. Put it on our scale and take our paper filter, fold it right across the crease and open it up, fold it again, pop it right on top. I'm gonna take your hot water and we're just going to rinse the filter real quickly. All right. I'm gonna take that hot water that we just poured in there and dump that right out. Next, we're gonna take our 25 grams of coffee, tear the scale, pour it right on top. I'm gonna to tear it. Then we're gonna take our hot water and we're gonna do what they call the bloom. So the bloom is where we're gonna saturate all the coffee grounds and make sure that everything's wet just so we can get the perfect flavor out of it. I'm not putting in a lot of water, just enough to get everything a little bit wet. Now we're going to wait about 30 seconds and it's going to release all its gases. All right, for our recipe, we're going to use a 16 to 1 ratio. So 16 grams of water to 1 gram of coffee. So with the 25 grams of coffee, we're going to do a 400 gram pour for the total amount. Here we go. We're going to do a nice spiral as we pour and the coffee is going to drain right through. And it's going to grab all the flavors that it wants, all the, all the flavor that the coffee has to offer. A little trick that you can use if you don't have a kettle with a thermometer on it is you can bring it to a boil and let it sit for about 30 seconds and I'll be ready at the perfect temperature. I'm gonna drain this through and it's gonna take about two and a half minutes. Just about drained. When you're done, we'll be able to have a nice flat bed of coffee grounds if you did a good job. And you're all set. Take this off the top, put it aside. You guys got a nice cup of coffee. Enjoy. 
And that concludes our 2020 virtual STEAM night. I hope you had an amazing time learning from all of our different presenters and doing all of the really amazing activities. If you would like to reach out to any of the presenters or if you would like a reminder of what activity they uh, presented on, then you can head over to my website. I have a whole list of all of their contact information on social media and what activities they did. Um, and I would really like to thank East Bridgewater Community Access Media, especially Ann Kerrigan, for putting this all together. Uh, she's been such an incredible help, and this could not have happened without her. I'd also love to thank the ASA grant that um, Mrs. Clifford and I and a few other staff members uh, worked on together. And through this grant is how STEAM Night, virtual STEAM Night happened this year, um, which is how we made all of the material bags and had the budget for it. So really incredible opportunity for us. And I'm so excited to see what happens with the grant over the next three years. Um, thank you so much to East Bridgewater, East Bridgewater Public Schools for always supporting STEAM. Um, I hope that you have all had a blast tonight and good luck on the giveaways. If you need anything, reach out, check out my website if you want any more information and um, have an amazing holiday season. Bye everyone!